Best Podcast Ever is sponsored by the Gertzberg Law Firm, a full-service business law firm in Cleveland and Chagrin Falls that's changing the way businesses retain their attorneys. Go to GertzbergLaw.com to learn more. While you're there, check out Cover My Six, a complete legal audit of the six areas that most often create or prevent business lawsuits and government investigations. Go to CoverMySix.com to learn how we keep you safe. Enjoy the show. Ladies and gentlemen, you're about to listen to the best podcast ever recorded. To truly be great, you need to be focused. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to really dedicate the time and the passion to the thing that really lights that flame inside of you. Hi, ladies. Hi, Hi Alex. Alex. Oh, my goodness. How are you, everyone? I'm good. We're great. We're I'm great. good. You know, you know what I think? I think the uh, grandmother to non-grandmother ratio in this room right now is <laughs> um, weighed heavily. Zero. Two for two. Two, two, two to for one. Two. There is a two to one grandmother to non-grandmother <laughs> yes. ratio. Yes. And the reason, Nancy Santilli, for that, the most recent addition to the grandmother club, our good friend Molly Gebler. Yes. yes. Right yes. Congratulations. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And thank you for uh, holding down the fort while I was gone. Um, carry on some podcasts while I was loving my babies. I've tried. It's yes. been, it's been um, not the same well, without you, Molly. You know. But I'm glad that you're back. <laughs> yes, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Can you give us a uh, can you give twin us update? A, a twin report? <laughs> um, yeah, they're here. Yeah. They're here. Um, February 16th. Uh, my daughter called and said my water broke. Ruined and, my bracket. Uh, yes, <laughs> ruined everyone's bracket. Yeah. They weren't due till March 27th. So did you have a? Did you were you in the bracket? In the bracket? I was not in the bracket, yeah. but I did hear about the bracket. Yeah. So doesn't matter now. Yeah, doesn't Nobody matter. won. Nobody yeah. won. Um, and you won. Yes, I did. Oh, they're just they're they were pre, they're preemies. Yeah. They're little. Um, four pounds. They're both four. Um, John just turned four pounds and. Uh, Mary is four eight. Uh, they're home. They're breathing on their own, which is just right there is just mm-hmm. a blessing. They were in the Perfect. NICU for a while, but they are just beautiful and precious and smiling all the time. Yeah. It's crazy. And now just looking around and yeah, so it's it's just a joy. Just Mom's a doing joy. well. Mom's doing great. Uh, both of them. I'm just it, there's nothing like a Nancy can a test. There's nothing Absolutely. like seeing your daughter be a mother. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's uh, hmm. it's crazy. It's um, crazy. Nancy, how many grandkids do you have? So I have two. I have Natalie and Marissa, and they're five and six now. Five and six. And so to Molly's point, um, so my daughter Michelle is actually adopted, and um, she had my husband and I in the delivery room for the birth of our granddaughters. And some people thought maybe that was strange. And we said, oh, are you sure you want us there? Like, we can wait outside. And and she said, no. She said, you know, Mom, she said, you weren't there when I was born. And oh. she said, I really hmm. want you to experience this. And it truly was just the most miraculous time mm-hmm. of my life. My husband and I still, like, look back and go, it was just, it's, it is truly a miracle. It and is. so we're very grateful that she even thought in that manner to have us there. Were you there for both? Yes. Oh. Yes. Oh you know what's God, interesting? I, I, when, at the birth of my first child, I saw a distinct transformation in my parents where there was a clean break from them just being my parents to them being grandparents. They started acting differently. They were much happier with life <laughs> and with uh, with me as their as their child. And yeah, has Sam said anything to you about how you're a completely different person now? No, no? you know what? Right now, the twins is a whole just different. You know, it's yeah. it's um, they they're up every three hours, and it's by the time you're done feeding them and changing them it's time to start all over again and just yesterday they re- she called me she said hey can you check with junction auto mike mm-hmm. butler uh, on my lease because i can't fit the stroller in my car mm-hmm. at all they've 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 
tried everything and they cannot fit the doubles. And and she can't go out without the stroller because I sure. mean you could, but you're holding two car seats. Uh, so you need to be able to put them in somewhere and, and go. And so they're going to have to get out of their lease early because they can't fit the car seat in their car. Huh. How about that? Is that a reason? Are you allowed to? Uh, well, Do you have to pay extra yes. for that? I mean, there's a whole four. <laughs> yeah, they right. they want your cars early if you're leased because yeah. they want the low mileage. So All they right. actually encourage you to turn it in early. So we're going to try to work out something with that. But yeah, how about that? Well, plus it's it's Junction Auto, right? They're, right. Correct. They're, they're going to hook amazing. you up. They're good they're people. They're amazing. Yeah. So nice job, Junction just Auto. Just those kind of phone calls. like, And then just... Mom, formula costs that much? Oh, like, sure. You know, sure. They, she wanted to breastfeed. It didn't work out for her. And, you know, that's a financial, yeah. huge financial mm-hmm. commitment. Um, I said, yeah, that's... It just things are different now. You know, this, there's a whole swaddling thing going on. And you wake the baby up to feed them. And, I mean, just things that... Although I am old school, you never wake up with sleep. Well, they say with twins, it's just different. And with preemies, and that's another thing, like every, because that's what I'll say. I'm like, Sam, did you ever hear the saying? (laughs) And she's like, but mom, preemies are different because they don't have that sense yet. So, and their sugar spikes or something. I don't know. So, um, and you have confirmed that they do, in fact, smell like oatmeal, raisin cookies, and maple syrup. They smell like love. Yes. They just smell. I sniff them and kiss them. All day long. <laughs> and what's great is my, my son-in-law works nights. Yeah. Uh, and shout out to Caterpillar. Um, Cat, sure. the company, Caterpillar. The tractor company? Correct. That's oh. where he works. And okay. they sent just the cutest gift basket with little tractors and little books about construction. Oh, is that fun? Just the sweetest thing. Almost as sweet as my my box yeah. from let's, Nancy let's, Sicily and my heart. Let's and, just tell the audience yes. here, Nancy, true oh. to her tradition and legacy, came yes. into this conference room. <laughs> She's a gift giver. With, I mean, I walked in and Nancy was in the lobby over here and it looked like Santa Claus had been here. <laughs> and there's boxes and there's... So Only to the givers. Oh you're so you're sweet. very generous. Oh, and, so you know, I think that's wonderful for you to just be able to spend that time with your daughter and help her out now. I'm yeah. sure she's most appreciative. She goes to bed and then I just get them all sure. to myself. Mm-hmm. And, oh, I just... Mm. Mm. That's awesome. Mm. You look yeah. like you're I just beaming. Stare at them. Do you? I'm beaming and yeah. tired. It's a little mixture of beaming and tired. <laughs> so I usually get home at like one. One o'clock, one thirty, one o'clock. Yeah. Because he gets home at eleven, and I kind of get them situated, and then they like, can't go to bed. I mean, just been holding two little miracles all night. So. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it, it's it's amazing. Nancy, it's amazing. you're uh, you're. Uh, I don't mean to shift gears from no, talking shift about. No, shift it because I but, could talk about that. Well, I could have my own. You podcast. you could do a, a couple podcasts yes. on which on I know babies. I know our listeners are like please. Please, Alex, keep asking questions about Molly's grandkids. As they should. Right. Yes. But um, no, we need to move on. You, uh, your daughter's adopted. Yes. I didn't know that. Yes. That's great. Yeah. And, and um, how can I, I'm going to ask questions because I don't sure. have a filter. And then if you don't want to answer them, just tell our producer. Or I may not know all the answers yeah. to them, but that's okay. But everything's easily <laughs> editable, sure. editable yes. out. Yes. So feel free. No. Um, how old, wh- can you say how old she was and how old you were when you adopted? Sure. So when I adopted her, um, my daughter was four years old. Um, my husband, who had been married before, and he uh, unfortunately lost his first wife to breast cancer, um, they weren't able to have children, and they actually did the initial adoption. And uh, so they adopted her. I believe it was very early. I'm going to say like maybe a six-month time or maybe even a little earlier than that. And so she was always you know, with him. And then when we got married, I had to wait a year, and you'll know this, I had to wait mm. legally a year before before I, after we were married, to be able to adopt her. What's um, her name? Michelle. Michelle knows she's adopted, right? She, oh, of we're course. We're not breaking news. No, to her we're not right breaking now, any or... news. No, no, um, no. And I they met know Michelle from day one. Yes. Michelle was a chamber member, and I yes. didn't right? make the connection. Yes. Yeah, she just worked for DoubleTree and bring me cookies. Yeah, I miss you, Michelle. So, and she's just uh, it's it's interesting because then my husband and I had our son, right? So. What's interesting is Michelle very much 
looks like me, kind of has the same mannerisms. And so if you took a look at the two kids and said, okay, which one? Yeah. um, You'd be hard pressed to tell. Um, What keyed me in to to that and asking questions about it, 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 since we're having a children's discussion theme here, um, I really don't know of a more generous thing that you can do than adopt a child. Mm -hmm. You know, I really don't. I I think that... um, it is the most unselfish thing that you could possibly do because they don't, they really don't need your money as much as they need your love and your time. And um, there's so many that need to be adopted and Mm -hmm. here you are, Nancy, coming in. Well, and you know, for me, for me, it wasn't, um, I guess I didn't even think about that per Mm -hmm. se, other than their their children and, there was a connection when I first met her, and um, just always. I mean, I just care about children, and so for me, anybody, any way that you can make those impact for kids and and be somebody in their life, no matter whether it's an adoption, a mentor, or anything yeah. like that, that's what counts to me. Is just you know how you take care of kids and yeah. just love them, like yeah. like you said, they're they're so innocent, yeah. and um, they're all special. And then you go and become a mm-hmm. superintendent. Yes, Because right. you didn't have enough of kids. No, right. <laughs> never, never. <laughs> She's adopted a billion kids. That's yeah. right. That's look right. who just look, look who the cat dragged in. Just came in. My goodness, Robert oh. Hunt. As we live and breathe. Robert P. Did Hunt. I get the wrong uh, time? No, you're no, you're here. We wanted uh, to talk we're, about you. We're before. chatting. Oh, Nancy you. came super um, early. Um, oh, that's yours too. Yeah. Thank you. What is your middle name? If I say Robert P. Hunt. To William. <laughs> sure how you're gonna... yeah, but we're having close. a conversation about children, and so you certainly can relate to that because you have beautiful children as well. well. Thank you. You I do. Ab- al- although I do have to bring this up. If you didn't see a post from your wife that she put up of your kids kind of making marker faces yeah, they, or uh, drawings all over each other's face, it is worth a million dollars to yeah, see that they, photograph. They found some markers and decided to <laughs> decorate themselves. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I've seen that. You posted that, right? Uh, she did. Yeah. I'm going to have to look at oh, it. Oh, it is that. Purple marker, was it? <laughs> it's the uh, best. It's got a variety of colors. <laughs> <laughs> They're very artsy. If you don't thing. know, like alcohol <laughs> wipes are what takes yeah. marker oh, off of the face. That's right. Right. That's good for right. our listeners right. to know, I These think. These garden hoses, but the kids <laughs> don't like that as Power much. Washer. Yeah. Oh, um, my goodness. Are, are you a grandfather? No. No, he's right. too young. No. The, 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 the I'm grand- too, we're too, all young. too young, for goodness sake. Well, uh, you, That's right. You, we don't look like it. You, right? we're old enough to be no. a grandma. No. You've right. equalized the grandparent to non grandparent ratio in the room because I was outnumbered until you got here. Help. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, do you want anything to drink besides water? No, I'm good. Thank you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right you're get, if you get haven't closer noticed, to Alex throws up Dom Perignon to to the to our guests. That won't, don't tell them; <laughs> they're going to expect it now. But actually, Nancy brought us these big things of Woodford Reserve bourbon over there and a, a wine, wow. so we could drink quite easily the fine stuff. Nancy uh, bought me lunch at uh, Burntwood Tavern for the holidays. Yeah. And she had to leave before the check came. Oh, this again with story. this? You're making this up. I am making that up. <laughs> because we went back to Burntwood. We did. He, he, is, he is telling the truth. The first time I did have an emergency and I had to leave. But then I did make that up to you. Yes, you did. That's and I brought, nice you, I brought you some wow. gifts tonight because... Bob also drove me to Columbus for a meeting the other day. Did which you stop? It was wonderful because did you stop at the we did party? not. <laughs> no. We did not. No, we were on a mission that day to make sure we were there and back. But um, but, but did you go to Grandpa's Cheese Barn on the way back from Columbus mm-hmm. that one time? We did. Did you go? Bob Absolutely. and I were hanging out there was, in the yeah. Merlot, which was I, amazing. <laughs> was I think it, I was gone by the time I hit Cleveland. <laughs> I mean, it was oh. all you guys talked about it in was, Columbus. Was it as was it everything you thought it, it would be and more? Everything and more. Mind wow. blowing. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Mind blowing. <laughs> yes. Simple thing. And speaking of mind blowing, I had lunch at Punderson today. Jessica and I were out videoing all 
day for our annual awards and we stopped at Punishton, which is a chamber member. Wonderful, wonderful food there for They've lunch. They've done a lot of nice oh things with the with so the... highly recommend it. Hmm. And it's Restaurant. really not mm-hmm. really not far at all. Hmm. Just FYI. Um, Just shooting that out there. That's good to know. Thank you. Um I was uh I was serving as our crack research team for today's podcast, yes, Molly, because I, I thought I'd give links. I thought I'd give Nelly the day off. You were well, Mike. I guess I delegated the um, okay. the the research part of the research team, but then I read the research. Okay, well, that's more, more than, than I, I would. And I ha- there there's there's something that oh, boy, I've got a gripe. I've got a gripe with our media in Cleveland here. Right. Oh. So here's my gripe: if you want to see. Uh, news about Chagrin Falls, right? Chagrin Falls School District. Uh, a lot of it shows up in Cleveland.com, but very little about Kenston shows up in Cleveland.com. Because we're Geauga County. Geauga County versus but, Cuyahoga. But I consider us, and I live in Bainbridge, to still be part of the greater Cleveland area, right? Mm-hmm. And so I think that, because the other thing is Cleveland.com does a lot of news about Kenston, it's just all sports, sports. related. Right? That's, Whereas that, Chagrin, that's true. you guys got a new playground, apparently, or you've got one in the works, you bid on one and you want to bid, right? Yeah, so we r- won a grant to offset a grant. Some, of the, uh, right. some of the money that it, for the new playground at the new building of yeah. Philomathian. So that kind of news makes it into Cleveland.com, but, but not that kind of news for Kenston, which is a little, I mean, I'm not saying that the Geauga County news establishment is subpar. I'm just saying that I think Cleveland.com ought to spread its wings a little bit. Well, did you do any research for the, like at the Bainbridge Banner or Karlovex paper? Um, yeah, they do a nice job. They, they, they do. They, they, they yeah. cover, yeah. They cover I, us a lot. I think that the Geauga County publications, the Geauga County Ma- Maple Leaf is very good. Or what's that other, that other local one? Bainbridge Banner. No, the um, Chagrin Valley Times. That, yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. Did the News Herald any? has Kenston stuff. Um, I didn't. I didn't see much. Well, no, I, the Chagrin Valley but Times. But you can't research it online. Correct for right. these Correct. things. Yeah. Although uh, the Carlova or um, Maple Leaf, they they have online. They have online. Yeah. Well, so anyway, so he, I, I thought we would, um, I thought we'd play a little game today, right? Because the mm. thing is, Molly, you know how I had this vision, this dream of. Uh, I don't want to know your dreams. Well, the one I'm going to talk about. Um, I think that Bob and Nancy, <laughs> being the two greatest superintendents, certainly that we that know, if not of all time anywhere, uh, would make this really great um, dynamic duo of. Uh, like an, they could create an audio book or they can have a podcast, but they could really write the book on how, on higher education. Higher education? No. High school is not higher. Secondary education. Public right? education. Public, Public education. education. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. See what I mean? See, they've already written like, it. Already. They already got the title. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's so, public education. We just know this the sector that we're in, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, no, but you guys are really good at your jobs. Right. And I'm not mm-hmm. saying that just because you're sitting in the room and one of you brought me presents. Um, I really do mean it. And uh, <laughs> I think that was total <laughs> shade no, to you. No, I mean, Bob, I'm just we this is your third time on here. You could bring a present once in a while. <laughs> I got it. I'm working. I don't want to wait just, till four. I'm just kidding. Kidding. The, the present's going to be unbelievable. It's Number coming, four. It's coming in it's five coming. minutes. That's right. Um, no, but I do think that you guys are exceptional at what you do. I do think that um, there is that there it would a game be... in there. I'm getting there. Okay. I'm getting there. I'm setting okay. it up. Okay. I'm setting the table. That's what I'm doing. By gotcha. the way, uh, airplane mode on your phones, there, kids. If you aren't I'm already, on it. Bob, looking Got at it. you again here. Got it. Um, so I had this idea before that it would be cool if we did like this five part series. And then made it like, um, you know, a state of the state address or made it like into a book or something like that. And then, you know, it would be, you know, if Bob and Nancy, two great superintendents, could wave a magic wand and then run secondary education in Ohio, this is what it might look like. And we were having drinks at the time and they said, well, that's a good idea, Alex. Let's talk later. So then I said, well, I'm just going to do it anyway. Right, and so, <laughs> so, so you wrote you wrote the book on you public wrote education. The book. No, you're here. You're <laughs> here. And so here's no, what this is the first. Chapter. So this is this is where the game comes in, right? So I, 
you remember from the essay contest, we had that word cloud that we did where yes. the students... So those those of you kids listening at home um, who don't know at at the essay con the third year of the essay contest, we fed all of the students' essays into a um, an app, right uh, online, and then it spit out this word cloud that showed which topics the students chose to talk about the most, and. Uh, if you go to the, well, go to gertzberglaw.com and then click on essay contest and that'll take you to the essay page and you'll see the word cloud there, although Nellie will probably post it on the show notes here. But I thought that might be a really cool um, agenda, right, that we could talk about on this podcast. And uh, to be clear, Bob and Nancy had no idea that I did this. And, which is why um, they're sweating a lot more right now than they were a minute ago. <laughs> it's all good. It's all. Um, it's fine. The topics that the students um, wrote their essays about the most were guns, sleep deprivation, social media, mental health, suicide, drug addiction, and then underneath drug addiction, we just threw in um, vaping and tobacco, which depending on how you want to define drugs, I would define them as drugs, right? So I thought here, this is what the game could be, Molly. It's a long way of coming around. It's going to be a very uplifting show. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm thinking all the focus on uh, yeah. positive uh, well, things that we do I every we day. We talked about the grandbabies right. right. at the beginning. That's right. it, is, it is going to be a very positive show because um, the game is if I had a magic wand. And so... These are tough. Some people think I do. I know you do. I know for a fact you do, Nancy. Um, and it is a, a problem-solving show, which, you know, just like the essay contest was We Solve Problems, was the theme. And you guys, Nancy and Bob, are professional problem solvers. So I thought we could spend the next 45 minutes or so and then get Nancy to her board meeting on time, uh, finish the sentence that goes if i had a magic wand i would and you can't just say i would get rid of you know drugs mental health issues or uh, me or mental illness right like if you had a magic wand and let's well let's let nancy cho choose the first one and i right? i also think we need to say that they can't say uh, if i had a, a magic wand i would get a million dollars i'm sure a lot of these yeah. need treatment or our um, classes or education, which then needs money. So you can't have a million dollars to do it. Yeah. So I get to pick one from your list? Yes. And before uh, we start, I do yeah. need to do a shout out to, to Alex's sweater. It's a lovely it is. color it's a nice, on you. It's a nice it's a shade color of bomber you. blue. I do know what I'm bringing next time as my gift. <laughs> <laughs> See, you thought this was going to be all sad. He We're has talking a sweater. beautiful... Yeah. Bomber blue sweater yes, on does. tonight. Thank you. Yes, he does. Thank you. Yes. Um, yes. And I have a gorgeous um, tiger black. <laughs> <laughs> Underneath. Sugar and black. See? Right. Yeah. Um, uh, Molly, do you think that this is going to be uh, Bob and Nancy's last visit to the best podcast ever after this setup? Oh, uh, what those do you are think? some heavy, heavy topics. But I'm I'd so... like to start with one. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good. Because... I'd like to talk a little bit about vaping. Ooh, good choice, Nancy. Safe. And very safe. Um, I don't know that it's very, uh, it's safe in the sense that um, my magic wand right now, and I have to give a shout out to our Bainbridge Police Department and uh, Police Chief Jan Bakovitz and Officer uh, Brian Reardon. They've been working collaboratively with me to do a program on vaping, which we're going to oh. um, actually uh, begin this week, we have a professional development day for our staff. And so that's the first phase of it is that they're going to talk to our staff about um, the students vaping. And so I've had a lot of dialogues with parents um, in our parent groups recently, because what's happening is it's still addictive for students. So there are high levels of nicotine, and our students are getting addicted at a younger and younger age. And then also the other more dangerous substances that can go into, right. you know, the vape um, devices. And so, you know, even though 
stores aren't selling to the, to our younger students. They're getting them online, or they're able to purchase them just you yeah. know like back in what the day when the kids age? could get alcohol. We're seeing it at the middle school level. But when are they allowed to purchase? Like what's uh, the law? I, it's it's Is it 18? eighteen. It's okay. eighteen. Um, There's no shortage of ways to get your hands on it. Correct. Just like alcohol. Correct. And and I think the thing is, is it's similar to, you know, tobacco, you know, back in in my days of school where, you know, um, the smoking didn't seem to be that dangerous for kids. Well, the vaping is being advertised that it's that it's healthier and and it's really it's really not. It's actually um, very dangerous and um, going to be a problem for us, I think, in the future, too, because we don't know those prolonged effects, just like right. with smoking. And so um, I commend our police department. They're trying to look at ways to be proactive where we can work together. And so we're actually doing a program that will roll out next school year where students that are, you know, if they get caught with a, a second offense or whatever to the vaping, that they'll have to go into a program where we can have, you know, health experts and the police department working with them um, to hopefully kind of help them through that addiction and, they and make a change. Because right. that it is an right. addictive, they just think it's something that is the new cool thing yeah. On the block. I actually brought a thing on dueling is no joke, and it's uh, facts for parents about e-cigarettes. Dueling. So it, in the streets of New York City, every three steps, sure, there is something on the ground, and I asked my kids... What the hell is that? I forget what it looked like even now. But it is the little flash aer- drive. Yeah, the little, little aer- flash drive. The yeah. aerosols from I those. Said, Where, mm-hmm. What are those? And they, that's these cigarettes. Huh. And, and I don't think people realize that, you know, our young learners, their brains make those connections so quickly. And so that addiction becomes so prevalent for them. And depending on what they're putting into the vaping devices, you know, um, it's just... It is. It has become a, a big issue mm. for us. And well, and look at you. Look at how long it took for um, people to realize that that tobacco gives you cancer. Right. Right. I mean, right. it was decades when I mean, people used to smoke when they were pregnant. Oh yeah. Right. It was not mm-hmm. a big deal. Um, and well, also it was a different cigarette back in the day as well. They didn't have all the chemicals and stuff right. that they have yeah. in cigarettes today. But uh, that's but, why yeah. we. <laughs> Because my mother smoked during us. We... But it's, there's also a whole marketing kind of right. um, aspect to it because of the different flavors and smells. You know, it's yeah. it's it's an odorless, but because of the flavors. So they're putting in things that really I would equate it to being candy-like for kids. Right. And so younger kids are just, you know, it's attractive to them. And before they know it, they have this addiction yeah. to the nicotine. And, you know... Hopefully not, but could be worse substances being put into those devices. Well, what about like the candies and that, like kind of going up one with the drug addiction? Are teachers and, and your staff able to identify these candy drugs? The what are they called? That like has marijuana as a candy or? Edi- are you talking about edibles? Edibles. Thank you. That's the word. Oh, no, well, you no can get. I mean, you know that. I word. presume it, it's. Like, I mean, I, I they could Is look it... like they're just eating Starbursts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm, and I'm sure Nancy does as well. We're constantly doing professional development, school resource officers, right. blowing things in, showing our staff, you know, how these can be concealed. Um, you know, the vaping is a whole unique challenge now. I mean, it can happen in a restroom. It's not like, you know, when we were in school and you walked by a restroom and it just reeked yeah. of mm-hmm. cigarettes, it's no scent. It can happen quickly behind a stall. And, you know, it's a, it's a real problem. And... The uh, you know the 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 way that is growing in terms of frequency of use um, is very very concerning. Certainly. Are they metal mm-hmm. or glass? Like the actual? I think they're plastic. plastic. Are they plastic? Right. Yeah. So um, if I had a magic wand, Bob Nancy, what would you do with it with respect to vaping in schools and by or by by your students? I think for me the first part is is maybe just the awareness because um, I think sometimes our parents and in talking to some of our parents, 
they don't realize the dangers of it either. Again, it's it's something that's being advertised that it's safe. It's a healthy alternative to smoking. Um, and so our parents are going, okay, but I I don't want my my child to smoke cigarettes. And so is that is that better? And I don't think that they're realizing. So my magic wand would be just to create like a better awareness that's right now and educate, you know, our parents and our community on that and um working together with kind of the health officials and and like I said our local law enforcement to help our our teachers and our parents and so that's what we're starting with actually this week where we can um, work with our teachers so that they can again see some of it how does this happen in your class or whatever it's it's um, and and just create that awareness for them so if I can't just wipe it away which you right. said I can't do right, right. Um, I would. I think I would phrase it and similar to what she's, Nancy said, is accelerate the tipping point. So if you think back to, you know, the '60s and where the prevalence of smoking in restaurants and all around us eventually reached a tipping point as a nation where we understood that this is really doing some very harmful things. And now, if you compare to where we are today, compared to where we used to be, um, and you know that whether it was through the media, through education, all of those outlets, I want to accelerate the tipping point. I want to get the knowledge out mm-hmm. quicker. We've got different avenues to get communication out so people start to understand the implications of it so you can, you know, start to deter it. Much like I mean, I think is is is, you know, negative as tobacco and cigarettes is a is a, a very sad event in terms of, you know, what it did to people for a long time. It's there's a bit of success there when you think about how much things have changed when people when they started understanding the implications yeah even advertising sure. yeah remember i mean the magazines back in the 70s oh, every all page. over and everything right. yeah. i mean on airplanes you could smoke and... you could smoke everywhere yeah. and um so i i do i think it's and i would put those two together the vaping and the tobacco i mean it's right. yeah. it, there's not a difference in terms of their harmful effects we should get brian reardon on the podcast not only does he make the best Buffalo. Oh, did you, have wings you up? had it? Oh this, my gosh. Just this weekend Five was oh, oh fabulous. My lordy lord. Yes. Yeah, so he's a Bainbridge police officer and he has his own little business and called the chamber yes. and said, I hear you're the one to get the word out. And um, of course I had to try it before I you know a number of times. Before, yeah. <laughs> and I would encourage everyone oh, to try it. So you get it at Hungry Bee. Right. I know you can Hungry pick Bee it up at Hungry and Bee. Uh, Cafe Michaels. Yes. And um, and of course we get to see Brian uh, as he comes oh, in as your... our KRO, oh, and so, um, so I got to try it. And I actually, you know, my sister had said to me, "You're going to go on that podcast. Why don't you bring that to them tonight?" <laughs> and I was going to, and I should have because yeah, uh, if well, you we'll haven't have tried it, it is it is fabulous. It. So fantastic. Excellent. Yeah. Yes. Um, when I was in junior high school somebody came in and gave a talk on cocaine and i don't know why it was wow. in junior high but for I, I, for actually them. i think it was it was for a, i was in junior high when i heard it i think they were doing it for everybody but i'll never forget and this made me never want to do cocaine he this guy came in and scared the crap out of everybody with these stories about um cocaine gone bad right and one of the stories um, he, sh- he said that he-, he had this, this really graphic visual of somebody who had overdosed on cocaine and, um, their nose was just like a mess. And, um, unfortunately I think graphic fear sometimes works. I mean, there's a reason why there there are there's there's these stats out there or there's science out there that, that says that if you show if you put a picture on uh, a pack of cigarettes of like black lung mm-hmm. or something like that right. it it reduces you but know I hate to say it that I think in this day and age just those not graphics work as much. don't because these kids see worse graphics on a daily basis with all the games and stuff they're so used to that kind of thing I, I i'd be interested to see if maybe if they're just numb to that kind of you know how many times they watch someone get hit by a car on youtube they love that yeah but stuff. we had freddy krueger back then we had horror <sighs> movies back then there's something about 
the 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 realness of it when when you when someone is standing there saying this was my friend this is what happened to his face you know so yeah. there there's just I don't know. There are certain images mm -hmm. from your childhood that stick with you forever. And that's mm -hmm. one that I will remember for the rest of my life. And that's and him. that's good. Yeah. I mean, well, so I think, too, I mean, we do a, a program and you've talked about it before, Your Life, Your Choice. Um, yeah. And I think for some students, that's that may be enough, you know, to to make a difference, to say, OK, I'm not going to to engage in that or or go down that path. And so that's that's great. Yeah. But. Does right. it, does that wand reach everyone, yeah. you know, and, and that's the tough part of it. Yeah. Plus, I wonder if like today's parents, like I, sometimes I think that if that, that assembly that I went to in eighth grade would happen today, like there'd be this uproar, you know, like some yeah. parents would be like, why are you showing that to my kids? Were you Brush or Mayfield? Brush. Okay. Cause I think Mayfield has one of the, they've lost so many kids in high school for drugs they're one of the schools that have been hit very very hard with the um opiate addiction uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hugely mm -hmm. um bob you get to play uh wheeled with the wheel of maladies next year which wheel one of depression yeah which one which <laughs> which uh topic that was uh important to your students do you want to uh tackle next with your magic wand so i think before i dive into a topic, I would say that um, a lot of this is about a relationship between school mm -hmm. and parent mm -hmm. and community. And we all, you know, each of us have students that have highly engaged parents that are supportive. Each of us have parents that, for whatever reason, have less time at home. Um, and the partnership and role of community in helping even those students who might be at risk really hits almost everything here yeah and I, I think this this idea of understanding how important the relationship between those three I guess components of a triangle surrounding themselves around children is and if you know when we have success um, we, we talk administratively and with teachers all the time you know if a parent isn't able to do their part that means we need to do more in the relationship we need to carry that one a little further mm -hmm. and yeah. at the same point we can't draw a line when a parent needs help or is reaching out to us um, too often we get you know egos or things like that involved and I think there's been a this like deterioration of that relationship between school community and and home and if, if we could magic wand something, I think you resolve a lot of these things if you really focus on that as a foundation. So, so let's, let's drill down on that yep. one level. How would you improve those relationships? So I, I think there's a lot of ways, and you, you know, I'm staring at your screen, it says social media. And I think social media has done a lot of really good things in our ability to communicate and share some of the things that are going on. But it also has given people a place to uh, maybe hide a little bit and maybe express themselves inappropriately. Um, they've found a, a, a place in a culture in which they can gain attention mm -hmm. in a negative way. And it really has deteriorated that. So I, I think that is an area we could maybe improve upon and do a better job of in terms of regulating the self-regulation if you will um, amongst ourselves in a community would would help i mean that's one piece of that and that, the other piece is that again i think it's both sides i'm not just saying oh this is a parent problem I mean, school owns part of this too we have to be understanding of situations and not everybody comes from the white picket fence, perfect environment. And when we're in those situations, taking it upon ourselves to pick these kids up, put them on our back and carry them till that next phase of where they need to be. Um, but I, I think, again, the foundation of a lot of these things lies in, in, in breakdowns, you know, in that, I mean, I can, I can remember and my, my childhood wasn't always ro you know, rosy, but I certainly had parents that held me accountable when I stepped out of line. And if my neighbor, or if I was six houses down, they saw me stepping out of line. I was, I was as worried about that as I were, was mm -hmm. worried about my, you know, my dad at home. And, and I think, you know, we, we're still in good places where those communities exist, but right. empowering and making people understand the importance of that um, is, is, is critical, I think, to, to, to moving forward. Can you regulate social media at all 
in the school. I mean, these kids are definitely posting an Insta and Twittering as they're in school, supposedly supposed to be learning and being taught. Is there any way a school can regulate? Um, is there any blocks or anything that, you know, I know when the computer, when the school first got computers, I know that there yeah, was. So yeah. So we, we can on our network, but you know, you, you told me to put my phone in airplane mode. Right. All these, they pull out their phone and they go off of our network and now they're out in right, the world. Right, right. So that's, that's, that's tough. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to stay ahead of kids too, man. They're just so, they, I, I thought I was a pretty smart guy and I, it took me forever to figure out how to limit my kids, um, time, screen time on their phones. And man, it wasn't long before they figured out even how to get around that. They're just wicked smart. Yep. And there is this, um, constant, uh, soup of information that is faster than I can read it. It's called YouTube and Google. Yeah. Well, that's right. That's right. But it's also, to Bob's point, it's, you know, we work on student engagement all the time with regards to this child's academics. And, you know, we ha both have the opportunity to present our best and brightest students each, each month at, at uh, Chagrin Rotary. And we say all the time, that, you know, it's a tribute to the parents that are there, that are involved, that are really working with us and working with their, their child. And so, you know, what I would encourage the parents to do is, is make those connections with one another. Get to know your neighbor, get to know the other families that are involved and doing things together. Like, I, we lose some of that connectedness. And um, to Bob's point, it, it takes the school as well, but it's also something where if parents would talk to one another and come up with strategies. You know, I've had, I, I have a board member who, when the students come into her house, the phones all get set aside and, and because she wants that dialogue. I have uh, another one when they're transporting students anywhere. They said, we're not an Uber driver, so you have to have a conversation in the car. And so I think getting back to some of that connectedness certainly can make a difference too. And at least then you aren't hesitant to pick up the phone and call another parent or when you see them to ask about something. And that's different than the social media where we're just doing a quick post and again, right. can remain anonymous. Well, it's this idea that, so how are you school gonna solve the problem? It's how are we going yeah. to address right. that? Is, and what can solving. we do? You know, there, there's an author named Cal Newport who just came out with a book about um, screen addiction mm -hmm. for kids and, and not just kids, but for everyone and and, and um, advising everyone to just remove any notifications and, and just unplug as much as you can. But he says in this book, I can't remember the name of it, that 20, 20 years from now, we're going to look back on this time and view handing kids a smartphone below a certain age, like before they're mature enough sure. to regulate their time on it as the same as 20 years ago um, and deciding what the drinking age should be or mm -hmm. the smoking age should be, right? There was a time when anybody could drink or smoke at any age. And we as a, as a, as a society decided, well, there's a maturity level that we should expect before kids get that responsibility. He's saying we're going to be looking at smartphones the same way 20 years from now when we see how more distracted they are and disconnected they are. Mm -hmm. But because it's only been 10 years, sure. right, right. Mm -hmm. that, that we've been handing smartphones to sure. our kids. And we said, like with the other addictions, we said, yeah. you know, the brain makes those connections so much quicker. And, and right. a young adolescent's brain is so much more vulnerable to, to the, yeah. you know, all the things that are coming at it. Are they processing? Are they really doing that regulation like they need to? Yeah. I, I don't to, know. To Bob's point, when you said that, you know, when the parent comes in and then you say you have to make it a a we and not a, just a school issue, how do you have that conversation? I mean, I know we've all gone through having one of our friend's kids do something bad, and then you have to share that with the parent. And some parents don't take that well. And then... The, your friendship mm -hmm. is severed because you know they're on the the side of their child. How do you have that conversation with these parents without that 
are you kidding me? My kid is great. You don't know what you're talking about. It's your problem. So I think, you know, what's important, and I learned this when I was at Kenston, actually. I was, you know, an administrator, you know, young, wasn't even married yet, no kids. And it was a very evident disciplinary issue. I can't remember what it was, a fight or something where it was, there's right and there's wrong. And I suspended the student. The other parent came in, or the parent came in and just was losing their mind at me. Um, and I basically said that I said, I cannot understand your emotion behind this. And they, they looked at me and said, you don't have children. Right. Then I got mm. offended and I said, well, my whole life has been about education. No, I don't have children, but you know what? They're right. So I think once you are a parent, one, you understand emotion. So it helps you in that conversation of being able to listen mm -hmm. and take it in and, mm -hmm. and, you know, eventually let them vent to a point where you feel like you've been heard and you try to find something in in what they're you know saying with value that you can kind of build upon and then i always like to when, whenever we're getting towards an end or we've de-escalated a little bit here's what we own here's what because we never do everything perfect right here's what we could have done better in this situation however here's what we're going to do moving forward let's talk about what you can do to help at home to help right. support it is. that it's problem solving and and it's it's like i'll own these pieces what are you going to own and and let's check back and hold each other accountable for that and, and you know and i'd like to, to just make a comment on that i i agree wholeheartedly i mean you we started the conversation tonight about your grandchildren and um it is so. It is so true. I I've said that I became a better teacher, a better educator once I became a parent because of that. Mm -hmm. You understand. You know, you're going home at night, and no matter what your child's done or whatever, you're still tucking them in at night, mm -hmm. hopefully, mm -hmm. and giving them the kiss, and they're yours. And um, that's so important to remember. And then as students get older, and I and my similar experience with a parent one time was at um, the high school age, and I had a parent tell me um, that they weren't going to allow what I would have imposed on them in a disciplined manner to change or alter their child's life and what they were able to do, you know, with where they were going to go to their college or scholarships or whatever. And I thought about that, and I thought, that's not up to me to impose something onto a child. That's up to us to work together. Our job is to educate the students, to make sure that we're doing a good job of maybe turning them around, similar to when you saw this school program or whatever, it mm -hmm. made a difference for you. So how do we do that in all aspects of what we're doing to kind of turn things around? That's our job is to teach them so that they aren't making those harsh mistakes later on in life. And some of those most difficult moments are the most powerful opportunities mm -hmm. to really right a ship and right. and turn things in the right direction. And, you know, there's a number of stories where that's happened with working with young people. It's just being able to navigate that conversation and at least giving them an opportunity. But at the end of the day, students got to step up, parents got to step up, and the school's got to step mm -hmm. up. Right. All right. Uh, Bob, uh, where would you like to wave your magic wand? Next. So basically, he's not letting you get away with just that umbrella. You don't thing. like that? I mean, no, I that was a good it, setup. I, I mean, liked it. Yeah. It was good. So I, I guess I would maybe move into this whole mental health issue, mental right. health concern. Mm -hmm. um, I know we've, you know, in driving uh, Nancy back and forth to Columbus, we we <laughs> talk about school. Driving one time. Yeah, one time. <laughs> I thought you were going to say in driving back and forth, we yeah. experienced each other's mental health yeah. issues. <laughs> There's a little bit of counseling involved for sure. Um, but I, I would tell you that, you know, the intensity and needs of kids is dramatically changing and you can point to all of these different factors in terms of um you know we've talked about it screen time video games desensitization access to drugs and alcohol all of these things you know family homes issues you know that that play into it uh, but the mental health services that uh, or needs of kids are dramatically different and i would say she's last five years yeah, i mean absolutely. it's really escalating at a at a rate that we are struggling to one educate our staffs you know to be prepared for them and to have the appropriate services in place in what way like in what way are you seeing this increase are the are the kids acting out are the like how are you seeing that this is I don't see heightened? it as an acting out I see it more as the levels of stress 
um, a kind of bouncing to your sleep deprivation, um, just an overall sense of well-being. Gotcha. Um, anxiety, it, depression, anxiety. diagnosis, yeah. um, the, the, the level of narcotics that are bringing narcotics. Right. You medication. Know, medication to bring treat to treat mm-hmm. kids. Um, it's, it's more pervasive um, and it's creating greater challenges. Uh, school avoidance. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't come to school. I don't want to come to school. Um, well, I all never of the to come to school either, <laughs> but well, all all of those things have just escalated, and wow. having the services in place, you know, from the social services, the mental health services, is a real challenge. I mean, it's a financial challenge. It's um, whose responsibility is this? Where do you draw that line? Um, and what can we provide realistically to kids? Is um, I, I mean, it's the it is the topic of conversation in our school mm-hmm. right now. You know, I'm looking to to make a recommendation on this from a staffing perspective to to my board of education. And you know, the idea of reading and writing arith- arithmetic. You know, the, the these are what we do in schools. Well, the definition of school is completely different, mm-hmm. and we're looking at having to add in mental health services. I was right. going to say, well, and it's and it's more and it's more than just adding and I don't I don't mean this in in any kind of negative connotation so I, I need to clarify that it's more than just saying well you need more guidance counselors because it's really not a guidance counselor position it it truly is somebody that has that skill set it, it becomes this overall like health kind of position this mental health right that is different than the counselor who's doing advisement on course selection and testing and you know college choices and everything right, and it's right. so how do you find those services and a lot of times you know we're also saying we're not mental health experts we're not I don't want my teachers to be a mental health expert we want to be able to help students and get them the appropriate services outside of the school yeah, and when setting. I say that I mean I'm not trying to say we're you know, right. s- you know having these services in it's more right. this idea of you know social workers that can embed sure. themselves with the families know what the resources are help families what get support? to places right, um, right. You know, Could uh, would it be illegal, Alex Kurtzberg for the law firm, the Kurtzberg <laughs> law firm, for a public school to partner with said Cleveland Clinic or UH and have a like the um, CVS has a pop up clinic in their little CVS? Could uh, UH or the no, they're, clinic they're, have there are model little... there are models mm-hmm. like they're, that that are right. starting to to pop up, and I'm not gonna put a name of school districts, but right, I, I do right. know we've, again, we've been looking at this, that there are relationships and agreements being established between schools and mental health providers um, that keep try to keep the cost down for the schools right. because the mental health provider get gets it, get it on the insurance right. side. And so those, those relationships are starting to because develop. I will say back in the day when I went to school, the counselor was there sure. for that one-on-one and how's it going? How's your? They really didn't guide us to college, to be honest with you. But they were there and to get a pulse on on correct right. And then they turned and into then this how college to, right person. And and I I agree. I think we need to. If it's not them, then it needs. And I think we had this conversation before. I mean, I think there should be somebody roaming the halls, and that should be their job. But they are a trained nurse or someone in that field who are. You know, like the the Mrs. Ponikvar or the the Debbie Gebler back in the day, where you're you're making relationship with these kids, but you have a purpose, and mm-hmm. it's to keep an eye on these kids and see. Well, you know what? Sally hasn't washed her hair in a week and a half, and she's wearing black now. And I yeah, think we need but to. It's, it's knowing when that's outside of my right. realm, and I need to refer this right. on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but again. Even the ones we know about are, are are more intense now than we've dealt with in the past. And, and that, see, and at younger ages, I didn't younger, mean to interrupt you, great. but that's much true. younger ages. Yeah. So, um, what's what really struck me about everything that all three of you said was that you said, Bob, that you've seen more uh, frequency and I think intensity and gravity of mental illness in the schools in the last five years. And you've been an educator how long? Twenty. 
and you too, Nancy, right? Oh, over 30 years. 30 years. <laughs> would you, and, and is that, would you share that assessment? I, I five, absolutely The last agree. five years? Absolutely. That's scary. Mm -hmm. because, hey, did, yeah. could it be the sleep deprived? Because the, we had, you and I growing up, we yeah. had drugs and alcohol. We had, what were the other comments that you said um, that were caught? Well, we social had, media. We had well, MTV came out, so we were glued to the TV. The only thing we didn't have were the cell phones. And I think these kids are staying up literally all night long yeah. watching these videos and all that. And then they're going to school and they're, they can't function. Well, I mean, so that's a group of the problems. We're, we're having higher and higher expectations for kids. Yes, I mean, agreed. Take algebra, right? That's an easy benchmark. Most of us took algebra. Well, when I was in school, that was a ninth grade course. You know, that you, mm -hmm. your gate into high school was algebra. We've got kids taking it in fourth and fifth grade. Now, that doesn't mean it's wrong for a subset of kids, but once that subset that it's right for are taking it and you know, Sally's parent hears that, you right. know, John's taking it, well, why isn't my, you know, and right. it's, it's really being okay with not putting putting enough that we're stretching kids and pushing them, but not putting too much on. Mm -hmm. And that's a struggle we're having right now. We're having these conversations because well, we've done a lot with this acceleration. Like, why do we, you know, the, mm -hmm. the model of school is basically based on factories. They rang bells mm -hmm. because right. factories rang bells. That's what the model of school is built on. And you went to a grade level because you were in age. That's changing. We're, we're trying to break that apart and really look at what's best. So you, in that, you'll have kids moving at different paces, which is all really good stuff, except if you're pushing kids too far and too hard. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Bob, if you had a magic wand, finish the sentence. Mental health. Yeah. If I had a magic wand for, for this on mental health, um, again, it, I think it comes back to what I, I said before about you know, all of us working together on this, but I, I would be able to immediately increase our mental health services. And I know those are dollars and people say, well, you're just, you know, just adding, adding, adding always. But um, this is the most serious component when you, when I'm looking at your lists, you know, suicide, guns, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm assuming guns, you're talking about school shootings and school violence, mm -hmm. all of these things, Go to the root cause health. back right. to drug addiction, all of it root cause back to a level of mental health. And being able to identify those things, intervene so we can move on with kids and so they can be happy and enjoy education. And, you know, the, it's systemic. I mean, it's so right. you, you can make an argument that testing is driving this. So you got, you, we have this litany of tests that we have to give to, all, to these kids and our teachers, well, you know, for a while there, their evaluations were based on these results. So they were, they were stressed about it and they were pressuring kids and then it was more on the kids. And now I'm in third grade and I'm scared that I'm not gonna do well because, you know, I won't, my teacher can get fired if I don't do well. I mean, just all of that is really layered on. And, and the it, number of activities, that, that, which are good for students to be involved, but so many things are so scheduled that it is different, Molly, than, you know, back in the day when we had just playtime after yeah. school or yeah, just some downtime. Um, and so all nothing. that. And, and so to the point of how many years we've been in education, this is probably the first time um, in the last few years that we're actually dealing with, with in-services on trauma sensitivity and trauma-sensitive schools and things like that. Um, it is. It's, it's kind of frightening. Yeah, so, well, I mean, so I've got, I mean, tonight we're now scheduling nights where we're trying to encourage families to disconnect from everything right. and spend time together. That's... And, you know, some people have criticized me, and I get it. Like, what, what are you telling me what I should be doing? But we're trying to promote that idea of sit around the table. We got nothing Read but Read a book to your child. Yeah, yeah, we got positive <laughs> feedback. Uh, and on Facebook when I post that flyer. Yeah. Um, so the chamber, we went to our chamber businesses and said, hey, they're doing this. What will you offer them? So, you know, Burntwood's free eating for the kids tonight and some of the arts mm -hmm. had art classes and you know come and just enjoy and so much positive feedback from the parents that said this is brilliant Great and it idea. is positive i mean it that's is. but those are things that i think we almost 
would assume or would hope that they that just happened naturally yes. and it doesn't anymore it's you know we're scheduling those times or we're making it a point to you know shut down everything else to just focus on that and i listened to your uh recent podcast alex where you were talking about how you organize um and just you do your goal setting and some of it what i really admired in there was there was a self reflection there was time that you were taking to go, you know, is this is this what I'm I'm focused on and and really look at is there a downtime? Yeah. And just that self reflection I think is is critical yeah. piece too. I wish that uh I would have started doing that when I was in mm-hmm. high school. Um uh Nancy, if you had a magic wand uh with respect to mental health issues in your school, how would you use it? Um, along the same lines of the things that we've already talked about, uh, I think that relationship piece is so critical. And that is, again, like Bob said, with the families, um, just community outreach, um, with the schools involved. But I also think that to the point of getting back to some of those basics with families and what are you doing? Do you sit around a dinner table? Do you have time where you're reading a story to your, you know, young learners at night, all of those things. I think that's, I think that's so critical. For me, the mental health component would be to really be able to establish partnerships with community organizations or the professionals, I'm going to call it, like you mentioned, some of the hospital settings or whatever, where they would be partnering with schools a little bit more. It's not a it's not an easy um, yeah, system no, to not, do that. There's not clear paths all the right. time. And sometimes the answer to the parent is, here are a few options. And, well, we've tried all those. They're full. They're closed. We can't get in. I mean, hmm. there's a service side to this that's, yeah. that's scary right. as well. Yeah. So my magic wand would be to break down some of those barriers so that there was more of a partnership and working together to be able to access some of the services and not place that back onto the school district and say, well, that's your problem. You, what are you doing about it? You know, Have you hired a social worker? Are you hiring more guidance counselors? Are you doing that? It's how do we solve it in a different way? Yeah. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening to our podcast. I hope you've been enjoying it. I wanted to take a minute to tell you about Cover My Six. For my fellow veterans out there and for those of you in law enforcement, you already know what Cover My Six means. And for the rest of you out there, it means cover my butt. And that's what we do for our clients. I've been litigating business cases for many years, and here's what I've learned about them. First, they're not fun for my clients. Even when lawyers knock it out of the park for them, Business owners and professionals in litigation find it stressful, distracting, time-consuming, and expensive. Second, I believe almost all business lawsuits and investigations are totally preventable. Third, almost every business lawsuit and investigation has focused on some combination of six key relationships. Those with customers, vendors, employees, shareholders, insurance companies, and technology. Knowing these three things, we created Cover My Six to optimize those six areas for businesses of all sizes. We create and facilitate the company's key documents, and we optimize their policies and practices in those six areas so that their owners and employees can focus their time and attention and money where they should, on making and selling their products and growing their business, not on lawyers and courtrooms and lawsuits. So go to CoverMySix.com to learn more about this service. I'm really proud of it, and there's nothing else out there that's like it. Our clients love it too. They get security and peace of mind from it, and I know you will too. Go to CoverMySix.com to learn more. Uh, All right, Nancy, you get to go next. Oh. So here, we'll cross that one out. All right. Anything still on the board? And let's, uh, by the way, take this opportunity. These are the topics that the students 
chose to write about in a problem solving essay. So we already start from the premise that these are problems that they're trying to solve. These happen to be the gravest ones and the ones that came up the most often, but they're problems. Right. So uh, folks that were tuning in to listen to a, a happy and fun uh, um, podcast, um, Again, it's I think that it's positive in the sense that we're talking about problem solving, which which to me is is the most positive thing in the world. But um, I really think it's important to talk about what the students perceived as the things affecting them the most. The th right. Really, what we saw with that essay contest was the students were given a magic wand and they told us this is where I would wave it. These are the problems that I would attack. So anyway, uh, Nancy, you get to so go if next. I had a sleep, uh, if I had a magic wand for sleep deprivation, I'd be using it on myself. But, <laughs> Amen, um, but I think there's more than just saying, well, it's sleep deprivation. And I think it's more than it just, well, they're up all night and they're on their devices. What I see with our students is their drive, um, their goals that they're setting for themselves, which in so many ways is so positive. But um, I look at like our student athletes and our kids that are in activities and they are just going and mm -hmm. going and the days are longer. And we're used to that as, as school superintendents. You know, we start first thing in the morning and it's 10 o'clock before yeah, we're, I don't know when you guys we're leaving. So, but for students, that's just wrong for me. They aren't taking time to go home and, you know, have a meal around the table. They're going from one activity to another and then they're staying up because that assignment is due the next day or I've got a be prepared for that test. And I think that's a big thing. We know the health benefits. And uh, for me, that's the, a little frustrating. It's it's not like we don't know this already. We know that everybody requires, you know, so many hours of sleep to have maximum health benefits. And yet we still keep pushing our young adults harder and harder to get into the schools, some of what Bob was saying to um, be the best at, at everything. And sometimes I think we just need to take a step back from that. I, I went through that with, in a good way, <laughs> with our wonderful football season. But I was with these athletes a lot of times, and I'm watching them. And, and even afterwards, when they were being invited different places, and I'm sitting there thinking, oh, my gosh, these kids really need to get home and be able to do their work and get some sleep tonight. And yet they just keep going all the time. And I don't know that that's good for any long periods of time for anybody. So. Well, and I mean, I think you can make the argument that to truly be great – you need to be focused. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to really dedicate the time and the passion to yeah. the thing that really lights, you know, that flame inside of you. And I'm not sure we're providing an opportunity for that. No, I'd rather they or go teaching deeper. kids the importance of that. You know, there there are exceptions to that for sure, but um, I think that is something we could work on mm -hmm. for sure. Well, and and sleep deprivation is one of those um, chicken and the egg problems, mm -hmm. right? Because you've got stress that causes sleep deprivation that then um, crunches the time that you've got to do schoolwork which causes more stress and it's just this cycle it is right um so bob magic wand on sleep deprivation how do you uh, how do you address it i don't know that I, I have the magic answer to how to address it i think the cell phone thing molly talked a, a lot about that i think monitoring of of the social media and the use of cell phones at night if you if you were trying to do a sweeping change to this you know forever and i think you know my according to my daughter was the last parent on the earth that you know until her sophomore year she had to put her phone on the counter and go up to bed mm -hmm. like it's actually going to stay here and it'll oh, be okay tonight you. oh yeah but wow. Those things, I, I think that is a big player in this. And then all of these other pieces obviously lead to that. So yeah. if we can improve in those areas, you'd hope that, you know, you're, you're attacking that issue as well. Nancy, magic wand on sleep deprivation. Mine would be to um, maybe, especially at the younger ages. Didn't we used to have nap time in kindergarten? Yeah, <laughs> naps would be this. great. But yeah. Um, Especially it got brought up at the essay contest yeah. with your students. Younger ages don't overschedule them so much. 
and allow some of this time that goes back to, you know, the normal bedtimes. And and I agree with Bob. My magic wand, too, for all parents is don't be afraid. Take those all those devices out of the rooms at night. They get plugged in someplace else. Right. They don't need them at night. Mm-hmm. Gosh, I remember going to bed, especially when the time changed. Mm-hmm. Like at 8 o'clock mm-hmm. would be the bedtime. When the time changed, it was like bright outside, and I remember still going to bed because that was that was the bedtime. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, who's going next? I think Bob – no, Nancy chose sleep deprivation. So, Bob, you've got a few left here to choose from. Got some hot topics. Some hot topics. <laughs> what do you mean by guns? What is well, that? so so the students wrote about guns in every conceivable context. Mm-hmm. Guns in schools, guns on the streets, gun control legislation. So it's as it's as I'll leave it as open to you guys as it was to the students, right? And it did just come after a shooting. Yes. Our essay contest was right yeah, at but the time. Parkland, of a... Parkland made but it's yeah. still it's it's oh, very yeah, sure. prevalent, yeah. right? Yeah. So my, my dissertation work is actually a case study of a school shooting. So I'll use that lens a little bit and talk a little bit about guns in schools. And, um, you know, that, I guess, issue is it, is it presents itself. Um, if, you, if you look at data and you look at statistics, um, these are rare, very rare occurrences when you, you, know, you think about the number of schools and, and how, how, they have, um, how frequent they occur. Um, but I, I'll look in, I'll point out a couple of causal factors of, you know, media especially as one big issue with this whole thing and how these are reported and how they're shared um, in terms of its impact. And interestingly enough, it's been all for the last, you know, I don't know, since Columbine, really, this has started and it's led to now. It's been all about well, how do we fortify, how do, how do we harden our entrances in our schools so, but they, to a point where they still feel like schools, but they're safer. Um how do we deal with the mental health and identification of kids and all of that? Um, just last week, I got an article from um, my nurse, of all people, uh, that, that the, the point of the article essentially said, all of this, all that we're doing now, all the Alice drills and all the training, and you know, my next PD day, we're doing Stop the Bleed. We're training, right. training teachers how to mm-hmm. apply tourniquets. So all of this um, that we're doing is is adding a level of stress and anxiety to kids, which maybe maybe they wrote about in this or not, or uh, to to adults. I mean, people went into teaching, and we've had the conversation of, do you allow teachers to carry guns in school? I mean, there are certain people, I could say no, I definitely don't want them to have a, a gun in school, but I can also say no one went into teaching thinking, right. I'm going to carry a gun one day. I may have to may defend have to myself, and maybe have to defend. So. This is a, um, it's a scary, scary issue in time because you can't minimize it. It's you can't ignore it. You want to say, well, it's very rare, probably won't happen. But then, what if it does? And you know, we there's there's the school districts locally that have that dealt with these issues. Um, so my my uh, my issue with this um, is more on the identification and intervention because once that kids you know switch flips and has made that decision it's really about how we're going to minimize the the end result right. of this right. um there's no there's not enough there's not enough metal detectors and there's not enough hardening you can do making your building prison like right. to prevent once that happens so although we do all of those things and train students how to react i really am more passionate about how do we identify how do we get on the front how do we what do we have for parents to be able to report things because almost every incident in school shootings they told someone else there's right. at least one other person that was told so that would have been the person or could have been the person to stop or minimize the event what do we do with that information and how do we try to create a culture in which people feel okay maybe it's wrong or not i mean i got a i got a text from a parent a year ago basically saying her daughter overheard x was carrying a gun to school today and it was 9 a.m now that played itself out. Nothing came of it, but that's what you want. You want uh-huh. somebody to be able right. to, to to reach out and open the door, so you can be more on the preventative side of this. And then I don't know if you want to go um, to to gun regulation and opinions on gun regulation. 
Uh, personally, I think, you know, I've, coming from a, a, someone who was raised with guns all around them, um, there was a period of my life where I was a hunter. Uh, I'm not sure we need the type of weapons that we produce at such a level um, that do so much damage um, so easily accessible. So maybe I'll draw the line there and let you push me to a place I get in trouble on. But, um, <laughs> well, that's a good magic wand answer, though. Yeah, I yeah, mean, that's... that is, if if we could really, in, really uh, have the supports necessary to identify and intervene, my magic wand would do that. And if we could limit access in a way that it wasn't so easy that would be a that would be and, a success and so and so um so much more violent yeah right i mean mm -hmm. here's well actually I, I i have some thoughts about that but i want to get your magic wand answer first nancy on, on, on guns. guns yeah so you know for me for me the frightening part is that um it's our students and the enemy is usually within yeah and so it goes to to Bob's point of, you know, how how are we helping those students? And it and it all of these overlap with one another. Mm -hmm. And I also believe very strongly that teachers teachers shouldn't be put in that position where they have to make those kind of decisions. We're there to help kids. I can't imagine saying, okay, staff member, carry this gun and now you may be forced to use it at some point. And it is it's um it is a little bit uh, upsetting that we spend so much time on school safety training in the sense that we have to. And um, that's a change. That's a change. I mean, we started off the school year, our first professional development was on blood stoppage and, you know, training our staff. And we need to do that to equip them um, with the tools for those emergencies. But it's it's a scary world when we have to do that. And that that's... Um, it just frightens me all around. And you can never say never. And yeah. um, I just, and it's, and it's long term. Bob and I actually had this conversation on our drive the other day about the aftermath and kind of the effects on people's lives um, because it's forever altered when they go through something uh, as traumatic as a school shooting. And we all know staff members personally that have been through that. Um, you know, my my brother, who's the, the fire chief, we've talked about that. I mean, he was there that day in Chardon. And, you know, the anniversary of Chardon just came up. Our hearts still go out to that whole school, the community, the people that are there. It never goes away. And um, it's just too long lasting. So magic wand for me would be, again, solve all of this with mental health and, you know, getting that connectedness and to the student point about if the, if you see something, you yeah. have to come forward. You, you may be saving a lot of lives. So in my magic wand would also include some very clear parameters for media and restrictions on how they report these types of incidents um, because again I think the many of these perpetrators have serious mental health issues and then they look at a legacy and the more we do to showcase and rise up you know bring those people to the attention they think I am really leaving a legacy and no right. other way I could this is my best option to leave a legacy yeah and that's problematic um, so did you guys watch that movie Eighth Grade? No. Oh my God, you guys have to see it. I watched it. It's uh, it is, um, for it's it's from the perspective of an eighth grade girl, and um, it is, it's fantastic. It it is filled with anxiety and fear, but there isn't. I will tell you without spoiling the whole movie. Don't spoil. I won't. Alice. I won't. Um, I will tell you that <laughs> it puts you into this same emotional state as this little girl is in throughout the entire movie and all she's doing is being a regular eighth, eighth grader, grader right sure. there isn't like you're expecting crazy things to happen that's all i'm going to say um but there's a scene in it when she is with all of her all with the entire student body and they're in the hallways and they're going through these drills of an active shooter and i didn't I mean, I, I was blown away by it. I couldn't believe that that is a regular thing, that that's a thing, 
you know, that our kids are, un are undergoing the same training that I had in the army. You know, I mean, it's not that different what to do when someone's mm -hmm. shooting at you. Um, so, um, I think that from an access standpoint, Bob, and this is where you ended. Um, I think that any legislator who doesn't make it harder to own a semi-automatic gun than they do to drive a car needs to be voted out of office. It's that simple. I think that they're buying into some crazy narratives out there um, that are completely clouding their judgment. And um, I feel like they're selling us they're all they're selling us all out. So if it's it's really simple. If it's harder to drive a car than it is to own or possess um, an AK-47, that's crazy town right there. Um, and anyone who allows that to happen or participates in it um, should not be uh, voting on important things. From a um, from a school standpoint, my magic wand would be to um, definitely put those mental health supports in there, like you both said, and also to, which I think we're doing a decent job with, encouraging people to say something. Mm -hmm. Because you're right, because they're... You, the one thing that you read about in every school shooting is there were warning signs. Mm -hmm. They're always saying, like e everyone says, "Oh yeah, I I should have seen it." Now, what do you what you do about it? I think you, it goes back to applying as many re community resources as possible to help that kid who's in distress. Mm -hmm. You know, because he's not getting he or she is not getting that help clearly. Um. And that gets back to the mental health discussion. Right. And the relationship side of it. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. know. Um, okay. So and, and yeah. I guess the last part of that is, you know, a lot of these scenarios are, you know, kids that come from really bad situations. Um, and it goes back to that community piece. You know, when do we feel it's okay or necessary to reach out and help someone else in a bad situation? Yeah. Whether that's just notifying someone. Or literally trying to help be a mentor, be, you know, reach out to a young man who's fatherless or, you know, right. those little things can change the, the, the path of a young person for sure. So um, these the last ones here we've touched on already. Right. So the, the ones we haven't specifically called out are social media, suicide and drug addiction. So those were three other big letter I think, we touched on them. I think we have, but yeah. let's just, um, I thought maybe so we can get Nancy to her board meeting, um, a quick magic wand. We're going to start with you, Nancy on social media. Cause I know you love social media, um, <laughs> magic <laughs> wand short of, short of, um, no Facebook, uh, allowed. What, how, how would you wave your magic wand at the, at the, um, some of the detrimental effects of social media real real easy um think before you post be responsible just like anything else and know that it goes back to maybe one of the core values that you know my parents instilled uh, on me which is if you can't say something nice don't say it at all yeah. let's start there and that would be my magic wand, and be willing to meet face to face, to problem solve, to talk about things, and don't just be anonymous behind that screen posting things. Um, words hurt, yeah. And so why not use words to uplift and to be positive? And I know that may sound, you know, like fluff, but if everybody tried to do that, I mean, we've all been putting in programs our high school this week has done a entire program on just say something and what it means is just to say something and be kind to people and um that's where i would start that would be my magic wand can i have a magic wand for this one definitely just a quick one because i think that the kids are so into equaling what they're seeing mm-hmm um, the the fear of missing out, the FOMO is, is that fear of missing out, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, and and them equating their own um, worth to others' posts, and am I as 
as as worthy as that person because they have this many followers or this many likes. So my magic wand would be to to sprinkle it over the kids and have them realize that 90% of the posts are only the good stuff and that is not the person that 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 one post doesn't make that whole person and those kids too have problems and they're sad and they they they're feeling all the same things that that you're feeling um it may not be in that picture mm -hmm. but they're they're just as human as you are i think these kids just kind of get caught up and they must have it so much better than me because right. look at them on that boat um yeah. and they have all those likes so they're so much better than me i mean it, it if we could all get back down to that level that we all realize that we're just all truly the the same yeah um i mean i don't think it's just to kids i mean i think there's agree. a lot of adults that their self-worth is via that social media mm -hmm. and what they post and what they see and the number of followers and the number of likes. Mm -hmm. And that's scary. I mean, that, that is scary, um, especially with kids that you, you, you know, your self-worth is really very superficial. If that's your gauge of things, it's really doesn't really it's share scary. anything about who you are and what you are and the quality of a person you are. And that, 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 you know, trying to solve that would be certainly part of it. And, you know, for me, I, I, I don't necessarily mind and I haven't had as much of it. I don't I don't mind the some of the comments about, you know, you could do a better job here. Have you thought about this? It's just like if you could it, it could be a real tool to leverage. If, it, if everybody came to it, we're going to be productive about the mm -hmm. conversation. It, it's the it's the personal attacks that you just don't understand. And I yeah. and I've seen them and they've come at me at times. And it's just like. You know, we are all human. We all make mistakes. We all, you know, but by and large, at least from a school perspective, we're working really hard to try to do the right things. And we come to it every single day trying to do better. And we're open to people's opinions and we'll admit when we're wrong. But to, to take it to a personal level, it just totally takes away from it being productive. And it's never the same. I mean, the days are never the same days. So all of these things, I mean, we're just going through this list. All of those things are bombarding us each and every day. And it's just, you know, which one are we going to tackle on at that on moment? Top of trying to teach right. the children right. and educating right. them. I have That's to tell crazy. you, um, I think it must be harder to be um, an administrator, a, a, a school superintendent today than it's ever been in the history of the United States because you're dealing with technologies and information flow and guns and all of these things that um, these kids are, are calling out that your predecessors weren't dealing with, you know, and they're, they're everywhere. The information flow is real time. It's bombarding them. It's limitless. Um, and, and I think that's unfortunately... I don't really see that stemming. I mean, I, I think the magic wand here really is, it, it comes back to community support, you know, is, is knowing that you've got these avalanches of stories and narratives and information and bad news and stresses all coming in in real time electronically, um, ha ha having that human contact and human support, um, be as prevalent as the electronic information is the real magic wand to me you know um i'm i'm tempted to end it on that note because these last two suicide and drug addiction are really to me the mental health in issues that we've talked about so much but are there unless, but i don't want to cut it short unless if you guys wanted to talk about it separately um do you think we've covered the um the, the magic wands that you would apply here in our mental health discussion? I, I do, but I would, I guess I, I feel responsible to say if, if suicide and that topic, um, you know, it's unfortunate. I've been through that as a, an administrator with a staff. Um, and it's something you never let go of. It never leaves you because you're always wondering what could have been done um, better or different. Uh, but, that that falls almost aligned with the shooters. It's identifying help in those kids, and if that's even a a joke at home or a conversation when somebody's angry, yeah. to reach out and get the help and intervene right now because 
kids' minds are constantly evolving, constantly changing. You add some drugs and some alcohol, and they can make a split-second decision that I am quite confident they regret, and certainly then everybody around it um, regrets going forward. So I would just say anything relevant or related to that comes out of a child's mouth, you, you know, you immediately have got to report and, and get some support uh, for the child and help for the family as well. And, and I would I would concur with that. At, at having been an administrator that's gone through um, several student suicides throughout my career, um, it is it is something that just stays with you, stays with the culture of the school, um, and and I would encourage anybody that is feeling, you know, at their wits' end for whatever reason, whatever the circumstance, reach out, reach out, and. Um, Let's see what we can do to help. Yeah, I mean, all all of these things the the um, the school shootings, the suicide, um, they don't happen. This goes back to they don't happen overnight. There's usually a trail. There's there's an escalating, a constantly escalating process where the kid at some point feels like they've got no other choice. Obviously, wrongly, but um, it just doesn't happen they don't just snap it's it's it, there's a lead up to it so um on that note um one of the reasons molly that i love 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 having bob and nancy on is because it uh brings us back to that debate that we we had when we started this podcast about what qualifies someone to be on our on our podcast and what what we settled on was impact people who have wide and deep impact on other humans and uh, i just can't think of anyone who does that as well as you guys i mean it i mean it's it's um it is really um inspiring and um humbling i i think so i'm 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 verklempt no but but it's humbling because uh, it's it's humbling um and it's inspiring particularly because um it makes me want to have that kind of impact uh on other people um and hopefully all of you kids listening at home get that same uh inspiration as as i do um uh, this was awesome. Bob, Nancy, thank, thank you. you for joining us. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Molly, thank you as well. Thanks for holding down the fort, Alex. No problem. <laughs> All right, kids. Thanks thank for tuning you. in. We'll see thank you next you. time. Thank you.